I want us to look at a passage this morning. It's in Luke chapter 13. But before I begin reading, I believe that this topic, in fact, when I was in Nashville preaching uh, the last uh, whatever Sunday through Tuesday, uh, this hit me and uh, I shared it there. And pretty much I'm going to share a lot of pretty much almost the vast majority is new stuff that I began writing down. But um, it's it's a topic I believe that is um, it causes more people to stumble in their walk with the Lord than perhaps any other biblical topic. It causes people to become uh, disappointed, disillusioned with God, upset at the church, angry, confused. Uh, if you don't get this topic down, you will struggle and stumble. And in my 40 years of ministry, uh, I, I, I would concur, I would agree with God that if you don't get this topic down, uh, you will have many problems in your understanding of God, the church, uh, how God is supposed to relate to you. So it's found in Luke chapter 13. We're going to look at the first five verses. I'll make some comments and then we'll begin to jump in and talk about this topic that is absolutely crucial. You say, Herb, I might not need it today. You better take notes because I guarantee you, you will need this sometime this week, this month, this year. You will need this topic. And if not for you, also to answer questions of skeptics or people that are, are poorly taught and poorly trained, uh, the teaching in the modern church has become very, very fluffy, very superficial. We stayed away from many topics that could perhaps ch uh, chase people away, which, which floors me because you have to grasp this topic as a believer. Join with me in Luke chapter 13. We will look at the first five verses and then we will commence. There were present... At that season, some who had told him, and him is the Jesus, had told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Two. And Jesus answered and said to them when they told Jesus about the blood that was of the Jewish people that Pilate had mingled when they were making sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people in Galilee because they suffered such things? Now, read behind what the question is. Read behind what the people are, are trying to ask Jesus. And he's saying this. Do you suppose that they were worse than others here in Galilee because of the things they had to suffer, the bad things that happened to them. Three, and Jesus says, I tell you what? I tell you no, but unless you also repent, uh, you also will likewise perish. Verse four, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all the other people living in Jerusalem? And Jesus said what? I say, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The topic that I want to share on this morning is basically, why do bad things happen to good people? That seems to be the number one question that lost uh, uh, church too, but lost people seem to have that they struggle with, that if God is so good, why does he allow these things to happen to me or my spouse or my child or my parents or fill in the blank? Why does God allow these things to happen? So I've titled the message this morning, Why Innocent People Suffer, Why Bad Things Happen to Quote Good People. Listen very carefully. Get the tape or you, don't, you can go online and watch it again and again. Each point that I will make this morning could be a sermon. I, I've debated, do I take six weeks and make this a six-week series? I'm going to condense it into one point. So each point, obviously, I'm not going to be able to go in depth, but I'll give you enough information that you can, on your own, look up these scripture verses and begin to dwell deeper in. So I'm not going to take six to eight weeks on why bad things happen to good people. Why do innocent people suffer? I, I will try to, I'll try to talk Texas fast, right? So I'll cover each point rel relatively quickly, but hopefully not too quick that you don't get the gist of what that point is. So let's jump in this morning and let's talk about why do Bad things happen to good people. You will have friends, family members, perhaps you've asked that. Something has happened to you, something that has happened to someone you love. You're not sure. Now, when I'm going to be talking about bad things this morning, I'm lumping that general phrase 
Why do bad things happen to good people? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say bad things can include a severe health crisis. It can be a financial crisis. You got fired from your job and, and now you don't understand how you're going to make it and there's this crisis in your life or, or, or perhaps somebody has walked out on you in a marriage and your heart is broken and you're stunned and, and you're confused. I thought I was a good spouse. How could they do this to me? And, and a calamity, a tragedy, a, a car wreck, somebody's life being taken from them at an early age and, and, and you're just not sure how this could be happening and you're left and you're stunned. So we can go on and on and all the bad things, but I'm lumping bad things into a general category as we get started this morning. So if you're with me, let me just quickly go over this passage. Two calamities, one was natural, uh, one, one wasn't, and basically uh, the background is not given. So I'm not going to sp- spend tons of time on speculation and conjecture, but there in verse 1 and 2, apparently Pilate had mixed the blood of Jewish people with the sacrifices they were making. Barclay, a very renowned Bible commentator, said uh, at this time in, in, in his historical digging, it's not in Scripture, so I'm just going to throw this out quickly, that uh, Pilate and the Roman government had wanted to continue to further build Jerusalem. And, and in doing that, they didn't want to have to pay with Roman funds. They wanted the Jewish people to pay. They took it out of the, uh, the, the, the temple money that was uh, uh, given over or set apart uh, to the God of the Jews, the only true God. And basically, the Jewish people rose up and said, that's God's money, you can't touch it. So they had gone to Pilate, and they had asked for that money back. And apparently, from some church history that Barclay says, that the uh, Roman soldiers were disguised as regular people, and they began to kill the Jewish people that were requesting the money back. And part of that, as they were making sacrifices to God, as they were stabbing the Jewish men, their blood spilled, and as they were making sacrifices to God, Their own uh, blood was being spilt upon whatever the lamb or whatever the uh, sacrifice that was being made. And so this is a background behind verses 1 and 2. The third one is uh, there was a tower of Siloam that was built. Remember this in this days, they didn't have airplanes. They didn't have uh, trains. You didn't have mass uh, collisions to where 50 or 100 or 200 or 300 people were killed. So these are national calamities in Israel. That's a lot of people falling. So this is the background in this passage. Uh, a whole bunch of people have died in two different occurrences. And then the natural question by the Jesus, the, the people that were following Jesus is, did they die because they were what? They were bad. Right? I mean, that's underlying. It's pretty obvious when you read that. Are they getting what they deserve? And therefore, are we, have we escaped because we're what? We're good people. I mean, that, read that. That's pretty much what they're saying. And each time they're asking that, Jesus is saying to them what? No, no, that's not the case. That's how we think. Okay, that's the background of the passage, which leads me to say, how do we uh, reconcile a good God with bad things happening to us? You'll need to know this for yourself because your your world is going to be rocked at some point when something happens to you and you're going to say, how how could this be happening? I don't understand it. So let's jump in this morning. I think I've shared six different points that I want to make this morning. Write it down. You'll need it or you'll need it to help answer other people. Romans 3, 10, 12 says this. As, as it is written, there's a whole lot of godly people. You know what? None. I've t- I tell you this every week. None in Greek means what? It means none. Thank you very much. There is no one righteous. No, not a single person. Verse 11. There is none who what? Nobody really is seeking to understand the things of God. There is none who seeks after God. Verse 12. They have some, a couple, most, all humans have turned aside. We have together collectively become what? Of really no use, we're not profitable to God in our fleshly state. And there is none who does good, no, not one. Paul, can you tell me how you really feel? (laughs) You're describing uh, our heart, uh, mankind, and he's laying it out there as the Holy Spirit is leading him. And he's uh, the uh, Calvinist would say this is the depravity of man. This is basically our state without the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. So let's let's get started this morning and and here's a here's a simple truth. 
When a person is very wicked or very evil, and something very terrible happens to them, or, or they die, they get in a terrible car wreck, or somebody shoots them, most of us, what do we say? Well, they, they got what was... We all say that. Nobody says, wow, I can't believe that head mobster in New York that has killed 400 people. I can't believe you shot to death. Does anybody ever say that? This thing keeps falling off. Do we have a rubber band or something? Or I got a little ear or big ear, but I'm going to do my best right here. Look at that. There's a rubber band. What are the odds of that? Look at that. I'm talking. Ask. And you, what are that happening with? Look at that. Okay, I'll just go here. Okay. So where are we at? So nobody is ever shocked. When a bad person, nobody ever says, I can't believe that happened to them. Nobody ever does that. Because in our mind, we think bad people should be punished and good people should be rewarded. We still think like that. Well, Jesus didn't answer that way. He says, unless you get your hearts right, you'll die and you'll go to hell too. You'll perish if you don't know God. He answers that question. Paul makes it very clear here, our state, our natural state apart from God. If we could go back to the days of Adam and Eve, and you were somehow related to them, and then you heard God was kicking them out of the, out of the garden and, 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 and how they were going to be punished, a lot of us would say, well, I can't believe God is doing that. How could such a bad thing happen to a good person? But if you know now in the 21st century, what you might not have known as a relative living in the days of Adam and Eve, you would say what? Oh, I understand why God did it. <laughs> we think somehow that we're good people and that somehow only good things are supposed to happen to us and bad people get what they deserve. Something has to change in our thinking because Jesus already made it very clear. No, they weren't any worse than you. Uh, comparatively speaking, if you want to compare yourself with Adolf Hitler, you're going to look pretty good. If you want to compare yourself with Jesus, you're not going to look that good. So the first thing I want to say to you as we begin to look at this passage is the reason bad things happen to, well, good people is there are no good people. There are no good people. <laughs> there's not a single one. They came up to Jesus. The guy said, hey, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one. Only God is good. The rest of you are not good. <laughs> Jesus had a way of telling the truth so bluntly that it offended people. I, I think, and I've said it before, if Jesus came to Hardin County, he wouldn't have a lot of people attending his church. He was too blunt. He was too direct. He would say, uh, if you being evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. Sometimes he would call mankind evil. Oftentimes he would use terms that uh, God permitted divorce because of the hardness of your heart. Over and over, Jesus was not afraid. He wasn't worried about being elected or how many people could walk into his building. Jesus was concerned with truth and love, and he always spoke the truth and love. And so the reason the bad things happen to good people is that there are no good people. None of us are sinless. None of us are deserving of grace. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Suppose um, somebody had committed a very serious crime against you, terrible against you and your family. I mean a major, major felony. And then uh, a couple of months later, you get a letter from them saying, I'm really upset with you that you haven't come to visit me. Right? They committed a terrible, terrible crime against you and your wife and your kids. And they said, I'm upset that you're not coming to visit me in jail. You're not sending me a couple of thousand dollars a month so I can have a lot of canteen money. And you're not, uh, you're not uh, 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 asking the local judge to reduce my time from life in prison to just one more month in jail. What would you, how would you write back? So what makes you think in light of what you did to Jesus caused him to die? What makes you think he owes you a good job and a good health and a good life and great relationships? Here's the first truth I want to share with you as we talk about this understanding of why does, why do bad things happen to good people? Because none of us are really good by nature. We live every day by grace. 
We understand it when it's a really, really bad criminal. We say they got what they're, what's coming. But somehow when it's somebody sweet or young or cut down in their prime of life and they weren't that old, we somehow think that God has quit becoming a good God. The fact of the matter is God doesn't owe, does God owe you life? Does he owe you uh, the, uh, the, the uh, privilege of being born? Does God owe you a great marriage or great relationships or a great paying job? And the fact of the matter is, no, he doesn't. Like I said, I can make each point a sermon, so I'm going to have to just leave some points at that. But here's the first truth that I want to share with you. God allows bad things to happen to all of us because there's none of us that are good. If you don't get that truth, you'll start thinking God owes you something. How many people walk away <laughs> from God, get bitter, and begin to blame God when something bad happens as if God owes them? Listen, so John the Baptist can have his head chopped off, greatest man born a woman. That means he was a little bit more holy and committed than you and I. Just a little bit more radically sold out to God. It's okay to him have his head chopped off, but you're supposed to have great health and great everything in life and great finances and, and everybody's supposed to love you and respect you. Let's see, Judas betrayed, he had pastor, he had God as his pastor. I, I would say that's a pretty good pastor. You have God, right? Have God as your pastor, and it wasn't good enough for Judas. And he lied, slandered, had him falsely accused and, and condemned and crucified. And who do I think that if that's how Jesus got treated as a pastor, everybody's supposed to love me and respect me and want to follow me? <laughs> if that's how Jesus got treated, and he's God. <laughs> And I'm a trillion miles away from Jesus as a minister. Who am I to think everybody's supposed to love, respect, and you understand this? Our, our, our understanding of who God is and what he owes us is so skewed that we screw up ourselves so often by thinking God owes us something that he doesn't owe us. I've said before, and I'll say it again. The only thing God owes me is hell. I've earned that. Everything else is grace. Here's the second truth I want to share with you because I can't take 45 minutes on each point. But here's the second truth in understanding why bad things happen to good people. Look at Galatians 6, 7, or 9. Don't be what? Look at Galatians. Don't be what? That means some teachers are going to trick you. Some ministers are going to tell you something to, to, to butter you up, to tickle you, to get you to pay a lot of money for their teachings because they're going to want to make you excited about something that's not true. And he's telling you, do not be deceived. Don't let anyone fool you. And if at that point you hear that and you go to the word and you choose that, then my friend, you chose to be deceived. But he's saying, don't be tricked. Don't be lured. Don't be stray, don't stray away. Don't be deceived because God will not be mocked. For whatever a man want. Now, that's not talking about sewing a hole in your pair of pants, right? That's S-E-W. This one's S-O-W. Whatever a person sows, he will also what? That's what you, listen, if you, if you plant, so I guess there's banana seeds or banana plants or banana root, then you're probably going to get bananas and not strawberry. Would, would that be a natural, right? You plant bananas, you're going to get bananas, right? You, 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 you plant sin and you're going to reap a harvest. This is what he says, for he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap. He who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap what? Everlasting life. Somebody once said that we love to sow wild oats, but then we pray for a crop failure. You know what I'm saying? We sow, oh Lord, don't let my, my actions come to fruition. Uh, okay, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. God has given you the ability to choose whatever you want to drink. So at lunch, if you, if you go out to eat, when you go home, you can choose water. Some of us choose tea. Some of you will choose Coke. God gives you the freedom to, to drink a beer, right? God gives you the freedom to choose two beers or four beers and six beers. And, and a person dies every 50 minutes in the United States of a, because of a drunk driver. Every 50 minutes in the United States, somebody dies because that's not including the people who are going to be maimed, crippled, blind, paralyzed, lose an arm, a leg. That just died from a drunk driver. So for every person that dies from a drunk driver, way more are seriously injured. Broken back, crippled, blind, like I said, missing arms, legs, we can go on and on. So for every person that dies, many, many, many that are injured. 
you have the choice to drink whatever you want to, right? You could choose to drink champagne or Jack Daniels, or but the fact of the matter is you also have a choice to drive after you drink. Now, every 50 minutes, somebody is getting killed in the United States, not to mention how many are going to be seriously injured. They have to retire, they're maimed, they're crippled, they're whatever they are, paraplegic, quadriplegic. Why does God get blamed? Why does God get blamed for those things? Why are people going to hate God, curse God right now in a hospital somewhere? They're at a graveside and they're going to curse God. God gave you the freedom of choice. He, he gave you the freedom. Listen, if God took away the freedom, your freedom of choice and you were a robot, had to do everything, drink this kind of food, you had to marry whoever, a person you don't like. If God took away your freedom, you'd be mad at him, but you're mad at God when he gives you the freedom of choice because we make sinful choices with the freedom of choice that we have. We love the fact that God has given us the freedom of choice, but we hate the fact that God is freedom of choice because when, because when we do that, we recognize that as humans, our heart is not always right. In fact, the second truth I would share with you is bad things will happen because we have give, we've been given free will. Angels don't sin. Angels don't, one time in history, but I don't want to get into that. They were allowed a third choose, chose to follow Satan. But angels always do the right thing. Because they don't have the freedom of choice. But you have the freedom of choice. And because of that, because as mankind, anybody here has made a, we say, I can't believe Adam and Eve. We're suffering because of the sin of Adam and Eve. That's just not fair. So let me ask you a question. In all your days, have you ever sinned? Oh, okay. So you have sinned just like I. So if your kids are, are suffering because of your sins, just say, hey, it's not my fault. I'm suffering because of the sins of my mommy and daddy. And we'll just keep blaming everybody. <laughs> Here's the second truth. Bad things are going to happen. We live in a fallen world and it's falling more and more every day. Bad things will happen because we have been given free will. And in that free will, we make selfish choices. You're in a hurry because you decided to watch a ball game. And watching the end of the ball game is causing you to be in a hurry. And so you get in your car and you drive too fast and you get in a wreck. Why is that God's fault? You're mad. You're mad at your boss because he mistreated you. So you get in your car and you, and you drive too fast and you get in a wreck. Why is that God's fault? We can go on and on and all the things that we do. And yet people blame and slander God. I thought, God, you're so good. The average person, when they get spoken against or, or, or something, it's, they're liable, they put it in print or they speak it, it's slander, they will file a suit against a person. You said this and that about me. And I thought, Lord, you are slandered every day by the billions across the world and you haven't wiped us out. You're a God of grace. You're a loving, patient God. All right, number two. Like I said, I can't take 30 minutes on each point. Bad things are going to happen because God in his beauty has given us free will, which separates you from an angel because an angel can't appreciate God as much as a human. They don't sin. They're like a robot. But we do, and we see our need of grace more than they do. They will not cause hell and wreak havoc because they don't have a free will. But you and I, we've been given a free will, and because of that, there will be sin. Now, Third, should I say, in addition to that, the third point will follow very closely. Look at James 1, 13 and 14. Let no person say, not a single person, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God for what? God, God's not interested in sin, right? God doesn't say, oh, that would be Jesus. Say, Man, that'd be nice to get drunk. Ooh, I'd like that Acapulco gold, I guess I'm so out of touch. I don't know if that's still hip, you know, back when in my 70s, both my brothers are small time <laughs> drug dealers, right? Sense of me, I forgot all the names. Lamont, I forgot all the names of the, of the doobies back, you know what I'm saying? Acapulco gold and sense of me and all that stuff. So anyway, anyway. I don't think Jesus is saying, man, this is good stuff. I can't handle the criticism of the Pharisees. Oh man, I can handle it now. <laughs> you know, God is not interested in sin. That's us. Where you, God, I know it's being silly even go down that trail, but let no one say when he was tempted, I'm, it's not God's fault. 
I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each person, look at verse 14, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his spouse's desires, his kid's desires, his boss's desires. Now what? Each one of us sins, tempted, we're drawn away. This is something, nobody puts a head, a gun to your head and say, I want you to lust now. Okay, you force me to lust because you put a gun to my head. Oh, <laughs> you do that on your own. There was a song by Ringo Starr of the Beatles. I think his only hit song. All you got to do is act naturally. Just act naturally and sin will come about. You don't need nobody to help you. You don't ever tell your kids when they're a little four-year-old and you bake a lot of cookies. You say, stay out of the kitchen. You don't have to say to them, now, I want, this is how you're sneaky, son. This is how you're deceitful. This is how you sneak into the kitchen and take a cookie out of the cookie jar. Have you ever had to teach your kids how to be a weasel and sneaky? Did you ever have to have any classes ever to say, this is how you can be deceptive because you're so pure and good and you've never had a deceitful thought? A- anybody here? That's what I thought I was in the right church, right? All of us. That's right there in my own being. I don't need to tell anybody how to be selfish or to think about myself. And this is what he says. Uh, and then he was drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when his desire has conceived, think about a, 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 a wife, a mother conceiving, when his desire is conceived, it gives birth to what? Comes out. And sin, when it is full blown, full blown, a what? The church is not suffering because of the sins of our nation. The problem is not that the White House is causing the church to stumble. The problem in our country is the sin of the church is causing the nation to stray. They are not the reason we are the way we are because of the impotence and the lack of holiness and purity and understanding of God's word and living a holy, godly life. The nation is suffering. The White House doesn't tell God's house how to operate. We then should set the standard and our nation is struggling, not because who's president or who's on the Supreme Court, because godly people are not living godly lives. It is our fault, not the world's fault. I'm sick and tired of government. Forget the government. Listen, in the worst government, the most repressive regime in all of history, the Roman government, listen, the, this little group of godly people without weapons, without great attorneys, without artillery, without anything, overthrew the Roman gov- government simply by Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. They fired nothing except for truth and love. So the third thing that I want to say to you as we look at this end, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. God doesn't make sinful choices for us. I just have to act naturally like Ringo Starr would say. It's my desire. It's something that I want to do. Here's three in your outline. We will suffer the consequences for our choices. We have a free will, and because of that, there'll always be sin on earth. And then, because of mine, forget about other people, forget about Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden. Uh, I will reap the consequences of my sinful choices. It might take weeks and months, it might take years before it comes about, before it comes to fruition. But there is bad things happening because eventually we'll reap. People right now think they've gotten away with something. There's people that think they've gotten away with murder. There's people that think they have gotten away, and maybe it's been for a year or five or 20 or 40, but remember this. What if they die and they never get caught? There's judgment day. It'll be a for all eternity. We will reap the consequences of having thoughts that are not pure. We'll reap the consequences of being jealous or envious or being proud and cocky and look at me, I'm a little bit more holy than you. Eventually, all those thoughts will be planted. They will take root and they will come back to haunt you. God is no respecter of persons. And because of the choices that we've made, bad things will happen. I was flirted. I went to the hospital many years ago. And there was this lady, and she was having health problems. I'll just keep it real vague. I'll leave it at that, what the health problem was. And I said, what do you think's happened? And I'll never forget this. She said, I know why I'm here. My attitude towards my husband stinks. 
And she went on to say he was not a very good husband from listening to her, right? I mean, he'd done some wrong things, but basically what she's saying was, in light of how he has treated me, I shouldn't be responding to him the way he's treating me. And God is dealing with me because of my attitude, and my jaw dropped. And I said, can I have you become a my co-pastor? <laughs> it's like, wow, you get it. You're one of the few people that I've ever talked to that is saying, what is happening is because of my choices. My jaw drops. She's saying, God is dealing with me. I got a sorry attitude towards my spouse. I'm angry. And just because he's treating me like trash doesn't mean I have to treat him like trash. I treated Jesus like trash, and yet he loved me and forgave me at Calvary. And my jaw dropped. I thought, that lady understands scripture. <laughs> she got well. And she's worked on that. It doesn't matter if he's treated her in not a very godly way. God doesn't say treat people nice because they've treated you nice. That's not grace, my friend. Number three, we'll suffer the consequences. We will for our choices. And this is why, this is why there is so much bad in our nation, starting with me and our world, and always will be. Here's the fourth one. Psalm 119, largest book of the Bible. And just here's three verses in Psalm 119. David said this, before I was afflicted, that word afflict is general, afflicted through persecutions through sickness or whatever is happening that is humbling a person. Before I was afflicted, David said what? I what? I strayed from God. Well, everything was good, man. I, I, everything was wonderful in my job, with my health, with my finances, my relationships. When, man, when I was doing those things, I strayed from God. But before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now what? Oh, now, Lord, I'm keeping your word. He says it again in verse 71, different ways. It is good for me that what? Anybody that says that sickness is the worst thing on life, read your Bible. Read your Bible. David said, it was good for me. Looking back in retrospect, I understand this now. It was good for me that I had been afflicted. I've learned now your, your commandments and your laws and your statutes and the things that your spirit says to me or your word says to me. Verse 71, it's good for me. I look back on it. It was good for me that I was afflicted. 75. Remember Peter? He was kind of cocky, wasn't he? Peter, man, he was, hey, out of all the people that jumped off the boat, who was the only one that had enough faith to jump off the boat when Jesus said, how many, how many did it? The guy had more, he was more bold than the rest of them, right? But he was also cocky. My friend, pride will, you'll fall. Boy, God has humbled me many times over the decades. Remember that story I told you? Of, I think he's from Kentucky. He got to be a president, I think, of the Southern Baptist Convention. And he was asked to speak at Georgetown College. And he said when he was on the podium, they were getting ready to call him up to come speak. He said he was kind of feeling like, wow, I've arrived. Little country boy. Man, God has raised me up. And I'm president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He said he was thinking all these things in his heart. Now, you're looking at him thinking, what a humble man. And inside he's thinking, I've arrived, man. Look at me, little country church, and now I'm president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He said as he was thinking those things, he stood up and got ready to go to the podium, and he felt something on his lapel, and he looked, and it was a white dripping. A bird had pooped on his lapel. And you know what he said? He said, thank you, Lord. Because <laughs> he thought, what? Well, I'm all that in a bag of fries. Pride is going to humble you, all of us here. He's going to humble us. And it'll feel like you're getting born again all over again when you realize there's sin in my life. There's ego and pride. I never saw it. I thought I was, I've arrived. I remember after I, I, I was uh, back, I don't know, 35 years ago, had an experience where I began to just pray in tongues for the first time. And Joanna and I were just meeting. And so I kind of dropped a hint like, you know, when you, uh, <clears throat> when you get to speak in tongues, honey, you kind of be on my level. <laughs> now, I was smart enough not to say it because that sounds awful arrogant, but that's basically what I was saying. You know, hey, you know, when you, you can pray in tongues like me, you've arrived, sweetheart. Whew, you've hit that upper uh, 12 disciple class. I didn't quite say it like that, but that's really kind of what I was saying, right? And she looked at me and she said, well, how will speaking in tongues help me serve the homeless people and witness to them and, and give them clothes? I thought, oops, let me get back with you. You got, yeah, you got me on that one. See, and you start thinking, I've memorized this many verses. I pray this long. I witness to this many people. And you start thinking you're all that in a bag of fries. Well, you're a bag of old fries that are moldy. Herb, tell me how you really feel. Just keeping it real, folks. I'm just keeping it real here. 
So where am I at? All right, number three, right? I, I gave you number three. Uh, whatever, I gave it to you, right? Yeah, we'll suffer the consequences. We, we suffer the consequences for our choices. Nobody puts a head to it, a, a gun to our head, and, and there's always going to be bad things happening, and not just to bad people, but to good people. Number four. I think I gave you number four, right? I was just starting. I was just seeing if you're awake. They're, they're awake, honey. They're awake. See, you didn't think they were paying attention, but I told you they would follow me. <laughs> All right, number four. Uh, Oh, yes, verse 75. I, I know, oh Lord, if you chase a rabbit, just make sure he's got meat on it, right? So if I, if I chase a rabbit, if he's got meat, it, it's worth going to. All right, let's get back into verse 75. I know, oh Lord, that your judgment, your judgments are right. When you had judged me, it's right. And in your faithfulness, Lord, what? You were faithful to af afflict me, God, and I thank you that you did that. You're, you're right in all that you do, and in your judgments, you have afflicted me. When things are going good, we really have no need for the Lord. Man, when I was making pretty good money out of college, General Motors, company car, expense account, shoot, flying to California to surf, flying to Mexico. I mean, I surfed all over the place, right? Life was good, right? I didn't. I, I know God, but, you know, I think I do. I think I'm saved. You know, I wear a cross when I go surfing. I'm a spiritual guy. I prayed every time I, before I got in the water. You know, you know why I prayed? That's exactly why I prayed. I remember seeing Jaws. Dunna, 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 dunna. So every time I got in the water, I was a praying man. Lord, keep those sharks away from me. I had a good tan. I said, Lord, I hope they don't like dark meat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> let them find some white guy. They don't have a suntan. Well, I was a praying man. I guarantee I was a praying man. But as soon as I got out of there, hey, where's the, who's got the best keg party in town? <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. When you look at these scripture verses, it's important that you understand this truth. If you were at the beach, right, let's go back to the beach. And uh, no, I can't go there. It's, I don't have time to go there. <laughs> Let, let's act like we're at the beach. If you have somebody, your loved one, your child or your spouse is drowning, right? All of a sudden they're going down and, and you see them and the waves are kind of big and you can't get to them. Would you turn around at, at looking at the lifeguard and would you say, uh, you who? Would you just give a little wave towards the lifeguard that's sitting in his tower? Or, or would you say, hey, I know you're kind of busy over there, but sometime in the next 15, 20 minutes, if you don't mind, I got a little situation over here. Is that what you would do? You know what you would do? You'd be as emphatic as possible with your hands. You wouldn't say if you got a minute in the next 30 minutes, you would say, come here, help, somebody's drowning. <laughs> Every one of us would do that. You wouldn't do the little wave. I know you're busy. <whistles> What's going on, guy? Hey, you know, when you finish eating your, your Whopper, your Chick-fil-A, <laughs> every one of us would be demonstrative, emphatic. We would do everything we could to get that lifeguard's attention. And this is what I've learned in life. Because God has been good to me and He's blessed me. That the blessing that He's given me has caused me to be thankful. But the times I've grown the closest is the time that I've gone through the most difficult times in my life. I didn't need God in the good times. I was thankful to God. But man, when God gets you over the fire and you're going through something and you just can't figure a way out, and you're going to be in this, it's going to last more than 30 minutes. Boy, those things get your attention, don't they? Those things, man, if God humbles you with health, like we go through health issues, we get cancer, and it's like, what the heck is going on? I don't get this. You wake up in the middle of the night wondering, am I going to live much longer? We can go on and on and on. All the things that can happen to you, and you're wondering, how could a good friend of yours stab you in the back? Haven't we been friends? What was ever done to you that you would do that? Do you want a title and a position so bad? Did you want to preach so bad that you were bitter at another person and jealous because they were asked that you would try to stab somebody in the back? Are you really, really that fleshly and carnal that you would do that to your own brother? You know the sting of that. In whatever area of your life, somebody wants your position at work and they'll lie about you to jump ahead of you. I realize in life that the good times don't draw me closer to God. 
the difficult times do. It humbles me and it, it reminds me of my need for God. I think of COVID that hit in March of 2020, so just over three years ago. I remember uh, I have, most of my friends are pastors or missionaries, right? I mean, that's who I fellowship with. That's who I went to college, I mean, seminary with. And most of my friends are pastors and missionaries or worship leaders or whatever they are scattered all across our country or in other countries. And when COVID hit, you know how many people were watching services online of churches? Churches of 50 were having 300 people watching. Churches of 200 were having five, 800, 1,000 people watching. And all my pastor friends were really excited. Whoa, look at all these people, man. They're watching online. And and, and I remember saying to myself, it's not going to last when it's over. Man, our church is going to be double, triple, quadruple packed. We're running 50, but look at 300 people are watching us online. When this is over, man, we're going to have to have three services. And I remember thinking in my heart, I'm running into people in Hardin County every month, and none of them are telling me they got saved. I'm running into people left and right. None of them are saying, man, I watched online. I gave my life to Christ. And I can't wait for the churches to open back up because I'm going to be there. And as the months kept passing, nobody was telling me. A lot of my friends, hey, my my party friends from back, uh, I went to a a college that was one of the top 10 colleges in the United States for a party school. How's that for, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) It's right next to the University of Texas at Austin. Hey, my old party friends in San Marcos. A lot of my friends said, Herb, we're watching you. But as soon as COVID started ending and people started coming back to church, how long did that last? All those people that are watching, are they saved? Are they coming to church? In fact, in most churches, most churches are down 10 to 25% than they were three and a half years ago. And that's just the truth of the matter. And I remember y'all can get all excited. Anyway, I'm not even going to tell you about, I can't, if I, you see, y'all know that they do patterns here. If we say certain words, they kick us off the air. We've been kicked off a bunch of times. So if I'm reading 1 Corinthians and I say, the Bible says these kind of people won't inherit the kingdom of God, a different sexual lifestyles, they'll just, they kick us off, which I couldn't care less. They got me, if you got me confused with a person without a backbone, you're confused because I'm not afraid of you, Facebook, right? Couldn't care less. <laughs> But, but I remember, see, a lot of times, if you watch it for three seconds, that's considered a view. So hundreds of people can be going to your website. They leave it on for 8 or 10 or 15, 20 seconds. And my understanding is that's considered a view. So pastors are thinking, wow, all these people are watching us. For the most part, a lot of them really aren't. They watched you for 60 seconds, and then they just flick down. And So, so what am I saying? Those hard times didn't last very long, did they? Because people didn't turn to the Lord, did they? The hearts are hard. But for those of us that are seeking the things of God, here's number four in your outline. God will use hard times to get your attention. Things going wonderful don't need the Lord. How many times a guy's got a great job, great paycheck, man, good hours, everything wonderful with his wife, his kids are like, leave it to beaver. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. Just everything's so good. How many times does a husband say, you know what, honey? Great job. Great income. Great car. Great home. Great positions. Uh, uh, our kids are doing great. I think we ought to go to church. <laughs> it don't happen like that. You know when you go to church? When you and your husband are ready to get a divorce. And you're desperate. And you're finally thinking, hey, maybe God can help me. You're struggling with alcohol, you're addicted to alcohol or drugs or, 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 or the pain of somebody leaving you or, or you lost somebody and you're broken. Then we finally think about turning to God. It's, it's hard times normally that lead us to God because up until then, we think we got the world by the tail. Number four in your outline. God will use very hard times to get our attention. Just like if you had somebody drowning, man, you would, you would do everything you could to get the attention of that lifeguard. God will use hard times to get your attention, to remind you you need Him, you can't live without Him. Here's, let me give you two more. Why do bad things happen to good people? There are no good people. We got a free will, and in that free will, we choose to sin, and in that sin, we make sinful choices, bad people, and quote, good people. I'm using the word good in a, as in nice people is what a person really means. They were a nice person. Why did this happen? 
and then what we just looked at right now, that God, God will use oftentimes very difficult times in your life. That's why bad things happen oftentimes to get your attention. Let me give you two more. Hebrews chapter 12. 12.5. And have you forgotten? You've forgotten this. As a Christian, we forget. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, as a true child of God, a son or daughter of God. My son, if you're a lady, my daughter, do not what? Don't despise when God chastens you. Don't, don't, don't act like it's no big thing. Don't be upset with the Lord, nor be discouraged when He rebukes you. Don't let you have what you want. For whom the Lord loves, He what? God will chasten. God will train you. God will spank you in a good sense of the word. And He'll scourge every son whom He has received as His own. If, conditional, you re See, you endure those difficult times chastening. God will deal with you what? As somebody that's saved. That, that, that's a good sign. For what son is there whom a father does not what? What dad doesn't discipline, instruct, and chasten his son? But if you are without chastening, if you cannot feel guilty about not fellowshipping with God's people and worshiping and, and being with God and witnessing and giving your talents and everything to the Lord, if that you can go week after week after month after month, then the Bible says you're, you're not His. How dare you say that? How dare you, go, how dare you go against the Word of God and say God's wrong? He's explaining to you what would be the natural feeling of a person that has the Spirit of God? And he says to you right there in verse 8, but if you are without chastening, if God's not training you and disciplining you and it doesn't bother you, you're not convicted in making changes about those parts of your life, he says this, of which all have become partakers, then you are what? A strong word. You, the word, it's used in the Bible. I don't like to use it, but it's a, a bastard. It's a biblical word. That means you don't, your daddy is not, you know, he's not your real father. You're illegitimate. Then Jesus is not really your Lord. Hard times. Hard times will draw you closer to the Lord. It's important, but let me give you one more. Because... Go to first, second Corinthians three. Let's look at this one quickly. Back up just a little bit. I skipped ahead. Let me just give you one more here before. Second Corinthians one three. Blessed is be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our what? Man, we're going through really difficult times. Paul says he's comforting us in these terrible things we're going through. We're getting beaten. We're getting. Uh, slandered and thrown in prison and all the things Paul went through, who comforts us in all our tribulations. For what purpose? That what? That we can what? So those re real difficult, hard times you go through, God is using them in your life so that you can now help other people who are going through those difficult times. Man, if God just kept everything wonderful, Man, I had this huge salary. Everybody just was hanging on to every word of herb. Oh, that herb, he gives such pearls of wisdom. We're going to line up. We need a church of 20,000 to hear that guy because, wow, pearls of wisdom fall from that man's lip. If everybody's loving me, then you know what? I'm probably doing something wrong. <laughs> I'm probably not really preaching the fullness of the word of God year in and year out. Paul says, when we're going through these very difficult times, we thank the Lord because in that we're able to comfort other people who are going through very difficult times. And I never knew, I've said before over, I never knew with tremendous health, never having missed a, a day of work because of sick in almost 40 years. That's a long time working without ever missing a day. That's a long time. And I still laugh because when the doctor said, you got cancer, son, that kidney's coming out. I was so stupid in my pride. I said, well, I'll be at work the next day, won't I? <laughs> he looked at me like, and I was so stupid. I thought I'll be the exception. After the surgery, I would wake up. It'd be a little bit tough, but I'd wake up the next day and I'd come into work because I wanted to be able to say I've never missed a day of work because of sick, because of my own sickness. And he looked at me like little punky dude. Three to six weeks. Yeah, but I didn't say, but in my case, I'm going to get up and go to work the next day. 
<laughs> I didn't realize in how many areas. If you'll just stop and ask the Lord. Sometimes I'll say, Lord, would you show me today all the areas that I'm, I'm proud in? I stop after like 30 minutes. It's like, that's it. <laughs> the list is too long. It's like, Lord, hold. That's enough. Okay, I, I get it. Help me one at a time to deal with this. So where am I at? So those difficult times are to help you to relate to other people. In fact, that's number five. Bad things will happen to us to deepen your ability to minister in greater ways. To, to deepen your effectiveness. Do you know, you can read a book on going through difficult times, and you can read books all you want to, but you're never going to understand how to minister to people with in difficult times until you what? No book. You can, I, listen, I would read book after book after book, read scripture, but it's one thing to put it in your head, and it's another thing to experience and live it out. That's why you, I don't care if you win Jeopardy eight years in a row, you can't be a president until you're 35 years old. Because there's some things in life you got to go through before you can relate to other people. I was so stupid as a young pastor. I thought my answer to every pastor that was struggling was read the Bible, pray and fast. And that was my answer to everything. Your problems will go away. Man, Herb, they're coming against me at my church and this and that. And in the street ministry, nobody ever came against me, man. We were all one accord and we had great relationships and we never came against each other. And so my answer to everything was pray and fast and read the Bible and your problems will go away. Until I had people come against me, I jokingly say when I got here, we had two people here. We had Baptists and we had Christians. You can chuckle because that is. And the Baptists, I didn't know they had claws. Thanks. That's in the Bible. Worship, throwing your hands up, interpreting, all those things are in the Bible. And I didn't realize, man, the, the talons and the. <laughs> So praise the Lord, the Baptist left and the Christian stayed. <laughs> but all that to say is that now when I talk to pastors that are hurting, I'm not flipping anymore. Pray and fast and your problems will go away. I said, brother, can I just put my hand around you and encourage you? I know that must be hard. Can, can, I, can I hurt with you? And you don't get that from reading a book. And God's going to allow you to go through some things because he wants to deepen your ability to minister to other people. Let me give you one more. Let's wrap it up. The last one, I just gave you the verse. Let me touch on it, and then we'll close in prayer. The last one is the one I had just read. Have you forgotten the chastening of the Lord? Because if God chastens you, that means you're His. And if He doesn't, and if you can continue to miss church, and it doesn't bother you, it doesn't matter if it's your spouse, your parents, or your kids. We like to say everybody's backslidden. But the fact of the matter is many of them are not backslidden. They're just not saved. And this is what Paul is saying in Hebrews. Let me give you a couple of more scripture verses. Lamentations 3.22. Through the Lord's mercies, God hasn't consumed us. Because he's a merciful God, he hasn't wiped us off this planet. Because his compassions are, they fail not. God's compassions are new every leap year. New at the beginning of the year and it, it, it expires in 30 days and you got to wait another 11 more months. The mercies of God are new, what? Every morning. Every morning. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the what? Wasn't, that, wasn't there a movie called The Transformers? Was it, a, was it a car that turns into a person? You like that, right? You want to see it again? Get the tape. I'm not doing it again. Right? Doesn't he? Doesn't this car turn into a, a robot or something you're being transformed from an animal into a child or daughter of the most high god we were lost we were pigs but god has made you a beautiful person made into the image of god back how you should have been and that's what the bible says we're being transformed day by day by day let me give you one more verse do we have hebrews 2 10 that i put hebrews 2 10 up there yeah there's a good one for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, uh, uh, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons, those of us that will be saved, to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through, talking about Jesus, perfect through what? Through sufferings. Look at that again. 
God had to use the sufferings of Christ, the sufferings of how he got treated every day of his life, and then at the cross. All those things were needed for our salvation, and this is this. 11. For both he who sanctifies the Lord, sanctifies, sets us apart, and those of us who are being sacrificed are what? All of us are one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call you your family. You're his son, you're his daughter because of the sufferings of Christ. What a beautiful truth. I will declare your name to all the angels, to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. Does a gardener trim back a a thistle bush? How how many gardeners? You're looking at me weird, right, Sue? How many of your gardeners trim back your thistle bush? You think, I've never heard of that. That's so stupid. How about a rose bush? Well, yeah. If you're his, then he's going to trim around. He's going to cut. And the reason he's trimming around you, so what? See, God's making a masterpiece out of you. And he uses sufferings. And he does those things so he can make something even more beautiful. See, only... Only once in history has something bad happened to somebody good. Only once in history. And he volunteered for that. And that was Jesus. He volunteered so he could make you not just more effective in ministering to others, but he could make you look like him. You were made in his image. Bad times, difficult times, they make you need him, make you more effective and make you become like him.